Good morning, my friends. My name is Lama Jigme Gyatso, and I'm a non-sectarian Buddhist monk, teacher, and healer. I'm on a live Skype call with Olaf, King of the Frozen North. At least that's what I call him. He lives in Sweden. Let me see if I can show you what his picture looks like. Hmm. And there's Olaf. Okay. <laughs> so Olaf asked me a wonderful question. Olaf asked me, what is a chondro? You see, my friends, if you go to my website, www.lamajigme.com, and you play with the tabs, and by the way, that link is found below my videos, so no problem there. And if you were to... Um, look at the tabs, there's a tab that says class materials. If you click that tab, you'll find yourself on the class materials page where there's a bunch of free stuff. There's a free essay and there's a free image. And the image is called the Triple Roots. It looks a little bit like this. Let's see, can you see that okay? That's ah, pretty cheesy, isn't it? Okay. The, so the bottom top one, much of you can say that, says Lama. The middle one says Yadam. The bottom one says Khandro. So the first one is a Buddha sitting by himself, and, that and that's of a, a line drawing of Buddha Amitabha. And here's a line drawing of the Buddha of Compassion in Sanskrit, Avalokiteshvara in um, Tibetan. It's Chain Ray Zig, and here is a line drawing of Samanta Badra Yab Yum, and below that it reads Khandra. So, what's the deal with Khandra? Another question you be asked what's the deal with the three roots in general? You see, it's been said there's three main schools of Buddhism you have Theravada, you have Mahayana, and you have Tantric. In both, Theravada, and, which is popular in South Asia, and Mahayana, which is popular in East Asia, they take refuge in the Three Jewels. Olaf, do you remember what the Three Jewels are? Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. That's right. So, the, a fundamentalist would say, hey, the Buddha is an actual man who became something much more than a man. He became fully enlightened teachers of gods and men, or the Tathagata, or the Buddha. A liberal would say, that may be true, or the Buddha may just be an archetype for the, to give us a sense of possibility that we could accomplish enlightenment. A, um, the Sangha it has actually two definitions. There's the general Sangha and then the superior Sangha. The general sangha huh, would be any man or woman who chooses to apply, who enthusiastically strives to apply, apply like that, apply Buddha's teachings. The superior sangha or the arya sangha would be the man and woman who, because of their enthusiastic determination to apply the teachings, have actually. Um, Accomplish the eighth or ninth or tenth bumi. Olaf, do you remember what the bumis are? It's the level of. Uh, oh, I don't know how to explain. No, that's very good. Bumi means level, and in one Mahayana system, there are ten levels. The tenth level being full enlightenment. And so, this Arya Sangha of the men and women have accomplished the ninth or the tenth level of enlightenment. They are really, really the people you want to go to for to follow their example or to follow their advice or to request their assistance, including instruction. So the third thing we, that Buddhists take refuge in is actually that was the third thing. My mistake. The second thing is the Dharma. And Dharma literally means, in this context, Buddha's teachings. In other words, the tools. It's not enough to venerate the tools. We actually got to use them. 
Or as I like to say, folks, it's much better to use a tool than to be a tool. Don't be a tool. Okay. So, all three schools, the Mahayana in East Asia, the Theravada in South Asia, and the Tantra in North Asia, all take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. But, the, in addition to the three jewels, the Tantrikas also take refuge in three roots. There is the root of the Lama, or the teacher, which is the source of blessings. There is the root of the Yadam, or the Tantric deity, whose mantra you invoke, and who is the source of accomplishments. And then there is the, oh, what's it called? Then there's the Kadro Daka, or Dakini, the a source of enlightened action, you know, or the root of enlightened action. So that sounds very nice, but it's kind of cryptic. So let's go into that in further detail. It's been said by many teachers of the Gelug sect of Tibetan Buddhism that if a Theravada monk were to stumble upon a big vial of poison, he would turn around and walk away. Because according to their perception, Theravadans are all about renunciation. The story continues that if a Mahayana monk were to stumble upon a big vat of poison in, in a clearing, he'd put a sign on it that says, hey, this is poison. Don't drink it. Don't touch it. Don't even look at it. Don't, don't, don't. And then, because people can be stupid, he'd also leave an antidote for the poison that says, hey, if you're an idiot and you touched or drank this poison, then please use this antidote and here are the instructions. However, it's been said that the Tantrikas, what they would do is they would transform the poison into bliss-inducing nectar and then promptly consume it. Well, that's a nice hyperbola, but what on earth does that mean? Well, transforming poison into nectar is a metaphor. You see, my friends, the poisons that uh, we were talking about, we were using the idea of an actual physical poison in a vial. Perhaps you saw Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, and you remember at one point he took a, a poison he, when he was fighting the bad guys to get the antidote. This was in the first reel of the movie. Well, in Buddhism we talk about the three poisons, or the five poisons. Olaf, do you remember what the three poisons are? No, I can't remember. Okay, the three poisons, according to uh, Mahayana Buddhism, and it would be hate, greed, and confusion. Now, confusion has two subsets to give us a total of five. Do you, Olaf, do you remember what those two subsets are? Not right now. Okay, the two subsets of confusion would be jealousy and pride. So, in a nutshell, according to Mahayana Buddhism, the five poisons are hate, greed, confusion, and the jealousy and pride that cause confusion. <clears throat> so, the Theravada, someone obsessed with renunciation, if they saw in their life, you know, hate or greed or confusion or jealousy or pride, they would do their best to run away from it as quickly as possible. They try to repent those things. Some people would try to repress them. Some people would try to suppress them um, and apply different antidotes. A mo Someone obsessed with compassion would say, okay, let's turn my hate into compassion by using the Tong Lin practice, the taking and giving practice, to take away other people's hate and give them the opposite of hate, which could be love. And of course, let's take away people's um, confusion and give them wisdom. And of course, let's take away people's greed 
and give them generosity. And by using the Tonglin practices, they would be uh, using compassion as an antidote for the three mental poisons. But what would a Tantrika do, according to the teachings? A Tantrika would use wisdom. They would, they would, for instance, they could use the um, awareness trainings. And if they were feeling rage, they could ask, you know, where feel rage, releasing. Where feel rage, releasing. And that could help them really tune in to the rage or the hate. And then they could use the um, some great vipassana teachings, teachings of interdependence, teachings of impermanence, teachings of not-self. And they could ask questions like, um, how could this rage be dependent? Then they could, after three repetitions, they could move on to, how could this rage never last? And then after three more repetitions, they can move on to, how could this rage not be me? Then they can return to the Dzogchen trainings and ask, how could this be funny? After three repetitions, they could turn to, grin with lips, really sing, grin with cheeks, really sing, grin with eyes, really sing. And then the general question, noticing, really sing. Three repetitions, they could do the one syllable version, which is this ease. After nine repetitions, or a total of approximately six minutes of meditation, they feel much better, much less angry, much less hateful. And so here's what's happened. By exploring the ultimate nature of hate, they've experienced its, its antidote. In Tantra, they t well, in Mahayana Buddhism, they talk about the five poisons, and then they talk about the five wisdoms, and then they talk about uh, the five elements, and then they talk about the five... Did I say Buddhas? They talk about the five wisdoms of the five Buddhas. And so here's the idea. We don't cultivate the wisdoms as an antidote to the five poisons by bringing the five poisons into the path of awareness and letting go it gives birth to the wisdom so for instance the if the poison of hatred if it's brought into the path of awareness and letting go it gives birth to the experience of mirror-like wisdom which is quite lovely, which is the ability to see ourselves and everyone else and everyone else and ourselves. In other words, to be a less of a judgmental prick, because no one wants to be a prick. So why am I talking about the conversion of poison into wisdom? Because that's what happens with our attachment. Consider childhood, if you will. An infant and a toddler is all about the devotion to mommy and daddy. In fact, before they learn how to say pick me up, they learn how to gesture pick me up, they reach up to their parents and go like this, and they just know that their parents are going to pick them up and give them some love. All of us have that mommy-oriented or daddy-oriented devotion or affection or, what's the word I'm thinking of? It starts with an S. Let's see, what's the word that begins with an S? Sentimentality. We're very sentimental towards our, um, our mommy and our daddy or whoever raised us. Now, someone might say, hey, that's bad. Don't be attached to them. But what we do in Tantra Buddhism is we use that natural devotion for our parents or whoever raised us 
as an archetype to experience, at the very least, the wisdom of, that comes from bliss and letting go. And so that's why we have the archetype. That's one of the reasons you have the archetype of the teacher or the lama. Devotion is not something you feel towards a peer. It's something you feel towards a superior. As a kid, mommy and daddy were at least your physical superiors. They were taller than you, stronger than you, bigger than you, heavier than you, much smarter, smarter than you. So that natural affection we have towards a role, towards a, a parent is brought into the spiritual path through Lama devotion. So what we're saying is if you already have, if you're already hardwired to be sentimental towards mommy or daddy roles in our lives, then let's find a way of using that to help us on the spiritual path. Outwardly, our devotion to our Lama helps us because it gives us the teachings and an example of what to do and what not to do. Inwardly, it's a source of blessings or healings. And secretly, our devotion to the Lama, whether they're male or female, helps us to feel gratitude and devotion and helps us to, to add our heart, which is a great way to practice the heart bliss or the Mahamudra of bliss and letting go. In other tantric practices, we do visualizations that also involve the Lama becoming very, very small, pea-sized object of light entering through our crown, descending our central channel, coming to rest at our heart channel, our heart uh, wheel, where we feel more bliss. So whether we're feeling bliss through visualization or we're feeling bliss through gratitude, devotion is a wonderful tool for the Mahmudra of bliss and letting go. Now, when we get a little older as children, we can walk around, maybe we're in elementary school, we might have an older brother, or we might have an older sister, <clears throat> or an older cousin, who is just young enough for us not to think of like an aunt or an uncle or a mommy or a daddy, but just old enough to be a role model. And each of us has had that person in our life that we just followed around like a little puppy, didn't we? And we very much tried to emulate them, and we tried to talk the way they talked, and walk the way they walk, and uh, eat the way they eat. And it's been said by learning specialists that <clears throat> imitation, that modeling, is the quickest way to learn anything. And so that's one of the reasons it has been hypothesized that role modeling and play are hardwired into all children of all species because they learn by mimicry. So rather than say sentimentality is bad and it's bad to be attached to your role models, in Buddhism we say, I'm just having trouble with the camera here, in Buddhism we say let's find a spiritual application of this. And so in Tantra Buddhism the spiritual application of a role model tendency our hero worship tendency is to have the Yadam, or Deva, or Devi in Sanskrit. And so in this tantric system that I teach, our main Yadam is Avalokiteshvara Chenrezig, the Buddha of Compassion. And let's see, in the second semester trainings, we learn how to bring the Lamrim meditation into the path of role modeling. For instance, we learned silent, long rim renunciation meditations in the first semester. In the second semester, we learned how to combine them with the verbal recitation of the mantra of the Buddha of compassion. And it is almost as if we are modeling his renunciation. In the first semester, we learned silence Lojong training, silent, compassionate contemplations. In the second semester, we learn to combine them with verbal recitation and visualization to bless others. And we're kind of modeling Avalokiteshvara's or Chen Rezig's love 
for the beings in his body, love for the beings in his environment, love for the beings on his planet, love for the beings on all planets. In the first semester, we learned silence, gratitude, generating meditations. In the second semester, we learned to combine them with mantra recitations to increase our devotion for the three roots and the three jewels and all the objects of Buddhist refuge. And it really makes us feel wonderful, heart bliss. In the first semester, we learned silent wisdom meditations, the wisdom of Dzogchen, as well as the wisdom of Lo Rig, the wisdom of Vipassana, and the wisdom of Maha Yoga. In the second semester, we take those wisdoms and combine it with mantra recitation. And so what we're doing is we're taking our built-in tendency to, um, to have sentimentality towards our role models. And we're finding a spiritual application for as one of the Pure Land teachers used to say, we can use attachment to burn away ignorance. For instance, if you lit a, 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 a match upon an ice cube, the match would melt the ice cube and then the water would extinguish the match. And so by the strategic use of sentimentality, we will ironically be liberating ourselves from the tyranny of sentimentality. So we talked about the sentimentality of a child towards a parent, the sentimentality of perhaps a toddler or a uh, elementary school kid to um, a slightly older peer, a, a brother, a sister, a cousin, a friend, and across the street neighbor in my case. But all kids in elementary school, if all things go according to plan, wind up in junior high. And they wind up in the throes of puberty. And oh, they get the merge to urge. Olaf, do you remember when you first hit puberty and you discovered girls? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Charlie's Angels was on TV then, and I paid close attention. <laughs> Um, and so, another form of sentimentality that develops in early adolescence is lust, is desire to mate uh, with someone we find sexually attractive. Now, Theravada might say, no, lust is bad, run away from lust. And Mahayana might say, yes, yes, craving is bad, take away craving, give peace. But a Tantrika says, no, let's find a way to use that lust to benefit us on the path. So if, if the tantric version for our object of our devotion was the teacher, the tantric object for our hero worship was the Yadam, then the tantric object of our sexuality, our sensuality, is the Khadro, the Dhaka, or the Dakini in Sanskrit. So let's explore that. Right here we have an image, I'm not sure if you can see it, of two Buddhas, if you look carefully, they're mating, they're having sex, they're doing the hibbity-dibbity. Now, a fundamentalist might say, yes, this is a metaphor showing the non-duality of perception and perceiver, or perception and object of perception. A liberal would say, would say nope, damn Buddhist is doing the hibbity-dibbity. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this, finally, Olaf, we're getting to the root of your question. I hope you've been. I hope your endurance is still still doing good, Olaf. You still with me? Yes, it's okay. <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. It's been said there is a translation. There's a saying in Tibet which can be translated into English, and in fact, it's a saying of the Kagyu set. They say this: there can be no Maha Mudra without Karma Mudra. Karma means action. Mudra means Union, so karma mudra would be boom, chicka, bow, bow, that would be having tantric sex. Now, obviously, tantric sex is a great way to feel bliss. And so, if you're really good at meditation, you can bring meditation with you into the bedroom, and while you're having sex, meditate on bliss, 
and let it go. And if you're really accomplished at the compassion trainings and the love trainings, you can share the bliss with everyone. You know, on the in-breath you could mentally ask what feeling, on the out-breath you could intend share with all. So while you're making love to your partner and you're feeling great bliss, you can be sharing it with others and that will cultivate your experience of the Mahamundra of love and letting go. Pretty cool stuff. Now, we don't always have a tantric partner. Sometimes we're in a relationship where there's a bump, or a relationship where we're not always, you know, able to find the time to make love, or sometimes we're between relationships. And then we have the jhana mudra, which means wisdom union, and it means, in that case, that would be an imagined tantric partner. And so a magic partner partner with or without masturbation would also create sexual pleasure, which is a great object of meditation that we just described in three parts. For meditating on bliss, meditating on love, meditating on awareness and letting go. Um, but in the first semester, my first semester students learn how to use the central channel, they learn the Tumo Yogas, they learn the central channel yogas of the root, the central channel yogas of the tip. So if they're a woman, they learn how to use contemplation to experience clitoral pleasure or G-spot pleasure. If they're a man, they use, learn how to use meditation to cultivate uh, phallic pleasure or prostrate, uh, prostate pleasure. Not for its own, not for an end, not as an ends unto itself, but as a tool to help us develop the Mahamudras of bliss and letting go, love and letting go, and awareness of letting go. But wait, there's more. There's a song, I forgot who sang the song. And I can't even quote it perfectly, so I have to do a sloppy paraphrase. Oh yeah, it was Sting, it was the police. I think it was Message in a Bottle. And I think it said, love can, can mend your heart or, or love can break your heart. And so friends, you can just be, you can be falling in love with someone. The first week you're together, you know, when every, uh, when every love song has new meaning and, you know, you're just high on your own endorphins and, you know, holding their hand is just the utmost of bliss. Well, obviously, obviously that's an opportunity to ex practice G-rated Mahamudras of bliss and letting go and love and letting go and awareness and letting go. But what about the other side of that coin? What about fights? No one can hurt your heart as much as the person who's already you've enveloped in your heart. Not like the blob in the Steve Bukin movie from the 60s, but metaphorically. When you've completely shed all your shields, no one can make you feel as loved as your partner or as hurt as your partner. Now, You've heard me say many times. There's two types of concentration, contrived and spontaneous. Contrived meditation would be counting your breaths. Spontaneous meditation would be noticing your pleasure, meditating on that, or noticing your pain and meditating on that. So on a bad day when your quadro, your sexual partner, your daka, your dakini, your life partner has hurt your feelings, you can bring that pain into the path of renunciation and compassion and wisdom. And you can benefit from that. You can bring that pain into the path of love and letting go and awareness and letting go. So whether there are a source of pleasure in the moment or pain in the moment, one's sexual partner, one's love partner, could be a profound spiritual asset. So, in a nutshell, the three roots of Lama, Yadam, and Khandro are about taking our three sentimentalities of devotion, role model, and lover, and bringing those sentimentalities into the path of spiritual productivity. 
I thank you very much for your time and your kind attention. Quick reminder, the Tuesday series of weekly classes begins this Tuesday. This is Saturday, so let's say Saturday, Sunday, Monday, three and a half days. The Tuesday series begins. If you live in Los Angeles, you can attend in person. If not, you can attend, attend over Skype. There's only so much room in the cafe where I'm teaching class. There's only so much room on Skype. So use the link below to contact me, make arrangements to register, and your earliest opportunity. May you and yours be healthy and happy. Omani Pameho. Bye-bye.